Hello, everybody. Welcome to day nine of the Winter School. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you our acting president and the provost at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, uh, Professor Abdul Wahab Afendi, an eminent professor of political sciences. He was formerly at the University of Westminster, where he also coordinated the Democracy and Islam program. He was a visiting professor at the Islamic Studies Center at Cambridge, and also was a visiting professor at Oxford University. Um, famous for his work, Turabi's Revolution, Islam and Power in Sudan, published in 1991, and also for co-authoring Contextualizing Islam in Britain, uh, published in 2010. Muslim News Magazine awarded him the Allah Iqbal Award for Excellence in Islamic Thought in 2006. He's the author of multiple books and articles, in addition to what I mentioned. His work has been translated to many languages. Um, again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abdul Wahab and I give him the floor. We can't hear you, doctor. Keith, like you can. No? Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I was saying uh, hello to everybody and thanks to Dr. Amal. And also thanks to our friends, our young friends in particular in the winter school. I have been following your uh, presentations and interventions with great interest. And I think that was really thought provoking and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, today, um, I think you'll be all happy that we are this all coming to an end. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, uh, present some reflections on the state. Uh, I'll try to uh, to maybe just uh, go through some snapshots. Uh, I think the idea of the state in flux is uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, and I should add also thought and ideas about the state are in flux. Whenever I read some work for somebody who is, uh, has a prominent contribution in this area, Usually in the introduction, uh, she or he would inform us how uh, their ideas about the state have changed. And the book usually would, uh, uh, would document this. So this probably also has happened to me. So I'm going to maybe take you through the flux of my ideas in the state because uh, I have been engaged with this issue for quite a while. And uh, uh, one of my uh, first book was uh, Who Leads an Islamic State, uh, which uh, has created uh, a bit of a row. This is a very small book, <laughs> but it had made a lot of uh, noise and uh, created for me a lot of trouble, especially in the second edition. But anyway, uh, the, the main theme uh, with which I struggle, struggled in that, uh, in that book, apart from the issue of the idea of the Islamic State, was the idea of the modern state itself. And also the, uh, the, uh, the, idea, the, the, the idea of a sense of state, the inauguration, the modern inauguration, which I think uh, a lot of people agree, has started with Machiavelli, uh, but I, uh, uh, I joined with him, Ibn Khaldun, who, was, who start, worked two centuries earlier, of course was not, uh, was not known in the West, but this, they, they, seem, they seem to have uh, done the same attempt, made the same attempt to integrate a science of politics. 
And this science of politics, the idea of it uh, is to place man as a natural being governed by internal and external forces beyond his control and also beyond his knowledge. For both Machiavelli and, uh, and Ibn Khaldun, uh, the idea was that the scientist, the social scientist or the social uh, the, uh, the thinker is the one who has discovered these, uh, these forces which are uh, governing politics. And therefore, uh, they, uh, they can tell the human being or the political actor uh, what he is really doing, not what he thinks he's doing or she is doing. And that also has, uh, has created what I, uh, I call the Khaldunian uh, paradox of arguing uh, that human action is, uh, can never be, uh, even when they attempt to act normatively, uh, it doesn't work that way because forces like Asabiya or Fortuna or, uh, or other uh, factors and also inner desires and wishes would be uh, acting on the person and then in this way you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, actually approach what is, uh, what is ideal. So the ideals are always to be subjected to reality. And uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, these ideals are also being voiced and maybe acted on for Ibn Khaldun and for both of them, I think, uh, usually rashly and uh, without thinking, because if you, would, if you were a good thinker, you would try to be realistic and know your limits and know also what you can do. Now, that's a problematic thing because it seemed to limit the human action. At the same time, this has led to another step, which is interesting in the sense that uh, while both of them were uh, foregrounding secular thought, uh, especially for Machiavelli and the late European thinking, they were defying the state. Uh, they were banishing God, but replacing him with the state, which uh, for, for example, Hobbes would be called mortal God, and for Hegel would be actually God incarnate in his end of history uh, narrative. Uh, so in this regard, if uh, this has posed uh, in, this, uh, in this idea of mine a, a challenge, of course, to religion, because if the state is God incarnate, as Hegel would say, uh, or uh, as Marx, for example, in, in other terms, would, uh, for example, speak about the proletariat, then it would be sacrilege to worship any other, anything else or any other god. Uh, so uh, at the same time, this idea of the, uh, of the state as the ultimate authority has uh, created in, in totalitarian, fascist and Stalinist uh, experiments uh, had uh, poured divine wrath on the on human beings and made hell a reality for many on earth. Uh, so I was uh, I was at that time uh, having a pessimistic uh, uh, the uh, idea about the state, and uh, uh, but at the same time I have noted in that work that uh, bringing the state down to earth has also uh, created a problem for the idea of, the, of this absolutist state. Uh, for example, there was a very, uh, only one monarch 
between Louis uh, Louis XIV, who famously uh, made the quip, l'état c'est moi, I am the state, and Louis XVI, who was actually beheaded by the state. So certainly this means uh, being the state is not a guarantee. Charles I, of course, before that was also beheaded by fanatical religious uh, dissidents. So in practice, while this idea of the state was being voiced and expressed, uh, it was undermining itself and it was also being undermined in thought by the uh, liberalism, idea, liberal ideas which came. So uh, in this regard, because of this, I was um, into the fashionable at that time, issues of civil society, uh, especially when I was working on the Sudanese state, that was my, my second stage. I was working on the, on the state in Sudan, but also on, uh, on peace and uh, issues of peace and reconstruction in the Horn of Africa. Uh, but I was also soon uh, disabused of this when I came uh, across an interesting uh, chapter in a book published in 1996 about Sudan. Uh, and this article was by a Norwegian uh, social geographer, historian. Uh, his name is Teritfet. And he uh, told a very simple story about uh, his experience in South Sudan with uh, civil society activists, especially international NGOs. And the story he tells about uh, seems to contradict our common idea that civil society is the salvation. And what he was telling is that uh, when he was doing his research in, in, in the south of southern Sudan, there was a province called Nimuli. Now, Nimuli as a small is not a small actually province because from edge to edge, the distance from, from its edge to edge was uh, like the distance between Moscow and London, very vast territory. At the same time, the commissioner in the, the headquarters of this, the capital of this district, had only one bike <laughs> to, to do his business in that vast state. Uh, but Norwegian church aid, which was also stationed in the same province, had a compound where it had 170 cars. So this gentleman who was supposed to be running this vast uh, uh, swathe of land, when he wants to send a, a letter to Juba, which is the capital of, the, uh, of South Sudan, he cycles to Norwegian church Ed's compound with a, a scribbled note on his, uh, maybe he had found the paper or not, and he would give them the paper. And then the Norwegian church Ed also who have got very good communication equipment will telex it to their office in Juba. And the office will take that message to the government headquarters and if they get a reply, then they will, they will do the same. So you can see how here the, 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 an NGO is supposed to be civil society is dwarfing the state as a whole. And uh, Terry Dvet's uh, argument was that in this way, uh, this kind of, of dominance does not seem to help statements or developing the state services because it's actually now becoming an alternative to the state. It has more capacity to deliver services. And uh, from that time I was, I had shifted my thinking a little bit to the idea that actually in countries like Sudan, you need to strengthen the state in order to have a better civil society capacity and this capacity being then directed in the right way. Uh, and uh, when I, I was reflecting uh, on this, I remember that, that, of course, the East India Company was 
an NGO, or not an NGO, but at least a, a civil act, an economic actor, was not a state. But the way it did, for example, in India and other places, was uh, to do uh, what most the most tyrannical states would be doing. Uh, a lot of people are saying this about now the multinationals uh, in, 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 but anyway, uh, I will revisit this when I, uh, at the end of my paper, I try to, I try to revisit uh, uh, Weber's uh, definition of the state. Now, uh, I, at the, uh, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the uh, <clears throat> uh, my comments on this was, was written in this also very small book for a state of peace. By the way, most of these books are available free on the internet. So this is called for a state of peace, very short uh, a pamphlet, not a pamphlet, it's a booklet. Uh, why I, 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 I rethink, I, 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 I do this rethinking of the state. Now, that was published in 2002, but in 2003, we started working on uh, the, the third Arab human view, uh, report, which was supposed to be published in 2004 uh, with the title it was a free, uh, freedom in the Arab world. Now, uh, we did, uh, I had uh, quite a number of colleagues. Uh, there were four of us who were the lead authors, but there were uh, teams of uh, people who write uh, background papers and a team of uh, advisory uh, group made of uh, many prominent uh, Arab uh, intellectuals and dignitaries. And we also have a reading group, which was also made of many uh, interesting Arab people who would then break both of all these groups would then read what we write and, and think about it. Now, uh, in that, uh, <clears throat> uh, during that process, I coined uh, the term the black hole state to describe the Arab uh, state at that time. Uh, and this was also a, a point. The, the idea of the black hole state is like the, the, the black hole, uh, the astronomical black hole, which is a collapsing uh, a star uh, with, where even the light cannot escape from its gravity. And it has so strong gravity. We we lack in the, the the core of the state of the Arab state in most Arab countries to this star because we, it sucks everything in and doesn't allow thing. Nothing comes out of it, but it takes everything and does not allow anything to move in this environment. Civil society, free economy, the media, all these things uh, seem to uh, to disappear. And uh, uh, the, the notion, of course, it, this led to, to a number of controversies, uh, but in the end, our uh, uh, one of our conclusion about scenarios uh, was uh, <coughs> uh, what was, and I think I'll probably have to read this because this is uh, not because it's important, but because uh, this was published in 2005. And uh, we predicted at that time uh, that this is uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the escalating repression and moral and political uh, vacuum, if it persists, uh, it could lead to the eruption of resistance that would be inevitably violent. And this could lead, and here this is a quote, this could lead to chaotic upheavals that might force transfer of power in Arab countries, which could well involve armed violence and human losses that would, however small, would be unacceptable, nor would the transfer of power through violence guarantee that the successor governance regimes would be more desirable. So uh, we, of course, contemplated other uh, alternatives, which one of them was the uh, remote possibility that uh, there would be a coalition of reformers and the states would, uh, would uh, uh, accept this and, and doing it. 
And the second uh, alternative was that maybe inter international influence would put pressure on the state. At that time, uh, there was uh, the so-called uh, uh, the so-called uh, Greater Middle East Initiative. Now that that initiative created a number of problems for us because uh, a series of the Arab Human Development Report started in 2002, and uh, it was celebrated in the West because they thought that this was a, a self-critical kind of Arab writing, uh, like not like the other ideological writings. Now, to our strength and chagrin, when the Americans uh, drafted their, uh, their, their plan for the so-called Greater Middle East uh, Initiative, they quoted extensively from an earlier, uh, the, the 2002 Arab Human Development Report, uh, all the things. And that, of course, since a, a large number of the group uh, we are working with, especially the advisory board, uh, were uh, uh, left-wing uh, radicals. Uh, when I arrived at one meeting just before, because I uh, I remember I was uh, coming through Frankfurt to, to Amman for that meeting, and I, I got a Hayat newspaper, but I didn't read it when I was there. It had somebody leaked the document, and, uh, and was published. So when I arrived in the morning to the meeting, everybody was upset. And, uh, uh, and uh, I remember uh, uh, the, the uh, publisher of Nahar at that time has already printed sections that was distributing to the people. And a number of them decided to resign, saying that this is really outrageous. I mean, this is just an incidental thing. but. Uh, what I'm saying here, uh, this is, this is uh, because it will reflect on what I'll say next. Uh, because a lot of people on the Arab Spring arrived saying, uh, we're surprised. We didn't know where it was coming from. Well, it was clear for anybody who was looking. And I, would, uh, I said at that time, my advice to them was to read. Uh, and and there, was, uh, there was no excuse for them. Uh, not to read at that time because uh, the publication of this report became an international incident for a simple reason that both the US and, uh, and uh, some Arab uh, countries, uh, foremost among which was Egypt uh, and Tunisia, uh, protested. The, the, the reports are published by the UNDP. So they protested, and I think the, the deputy foreign minister of Egypt um, invited the, the leader of the team uh, and said to her, if you publish, you are not allowed to publish uh, reports because you are a part of the UN and the UN is a member state organization. You do not have a right to criticize member states. If you do, we are going to uh, take on a motion preventing the UNDB from ever again writing anything on the Arab states. The Americans also uh, hinted that they are going to withhold money from the UNDP. So the UNDB had called feet and decided not to publish the report. And uh, they were contemplating options like uh, having a private NGO publish it and things like that. Uh, and at this point, then the New York Times published uh, uh, an article revealing all these machinations. The Americans were upset because uh, the, the things we wrote about Palestine and Iraq uh, in the report uh, were not uh, to their liking. And they were embarrassed because they had quoted the report in the past, so they gave it credibility. So if it kind of criticized them, everybody will take it. Uh, but when the, 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 um, uh, the New York Times published its report, uh, then they, uh, they, all of them said, no, no, we never did, we never said, and then the UNDB took this, uh, this opportunity and published it. So then when it was published, almost every 
media outlet in the world covered it. Uh, so the, the, the idea that people were not warned about what was going on doesn't, uh, doesn't hold water. Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, I still maintain that the idea of the, I think the, the, the black hole state has, uh, has some kind of, uh, of credibility to it because it shows how these uh, states were actually, uh, as we said, uh, contracting on themselves. I mean, you have the state which starts, for example, like Egypt as a, a, as a mass party state with certain ideology, uh, Syria the same, then this party would contract to a, a small group or a sect, and then the sect itself was, come, was uh, contract to a, an extended family and then to a small family, a nuclear family. Also, the Mukhabarat usually will take everything and leave no room for, uh, for anything else. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to skip uh, on the uh, Arab uh, revolutions and uh, our work on it and before it and after it. Uh, uh, but uh, I will uh, <clears throat> uh, look at one of my, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> my current works, <clears throat> which I, <clears throat> I think I started with, <clears throat> sorry, with, uh, uh, with a seminar on the Arab Center uh, a few months back, maybe many months back, Muhammad, <laughs> about the idea of the deep state, uh, which uh, I disparaged uh, uh, at that time, and I still do. Uh, and this links also is my work on populism. Now, uh, the idea of the deep state, I think, is, an inter is interesting uh, for us from our perspective for one important reason, other than other things. It was our inventions. This is one of the few areas of political science where a concept was developed in the Middle East and then traveled. Usually we wait for concepts to come from the West and then we run away with them. Uh, the idea of the uh, deep state began to emerge from Turkey, especially, uh, I think, in the middle 1990s, when a car crash uh, revealed that uh, there was a car in which the parliamentarian with a number of security uh, agents and a well-known uh, organized crime personality and some militias were traveling together in that car. So people then started to say, what's happening in Turkey? And it seems that there's something under. And a few uh, years later, in 1997, uh, the army in need was, was uh, dubbed at that time the, uh, the postmodern coup, which was a coup at, by remote control. The, the army did not intervene directly, but it, was, it made some statements and I uh, made some indications and also talked to some politicians. And the government at that time in which the Rifah party was a member uh, was, uh, was uh, toppled. And soon after that, the party itself was dissolved by the, by the uh, judiciary. And a certain uh, party, Ordovan, was arrested and sentenced to prison because he read a poem so there was a crackdown, and we saw uh, the political elite, organized crime, the military, the judiciary working in tandem to reshape the political. Uh, of course, after that, the concept was applied to places like Egypt and, uh, 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 and, and developed further. And then, but the interesting thing was, by the time Trump was coming into power, it became an American narrative about the deep state, which meant the American state itself. Uh, so uh, the, uh, 
uh, one of the extreme ironies is that the, the, the so-called QAnon group, of which we do not know the leader up to now because he's, the Mr. Q is still uh, into anonymity, uh, has been selling this idea of that there is a deep state. Now, this seems to be a, rever a role reversal. Uh, the deep, unknown, mysterious group that seem to attack the clear, clearly defined state and, uh, and its, uh, uh, its machinery. Now, uh, my reservations about the concept, uh, which otherwise we have been proud of it in has that we have invented it and we are marketing it to America. This is a good, good uh, kind of deal. Uh, instead of the Americans selling us I, uh, iPhones, we are now selling them political ideas. So there should be some profit somewhere in this. But uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not that impressed. Now, I think the main thing uh, is that the state is and should be a public affair. Uh, if something like uh, the um, uh, so-called deep state exists, we cannot call it a state because it is something, uh, especially, I mean, that in, in Turkey, there is a maybe a prima facie uh, argument <clears throat> for accepting it because <clears throat> at the time when this was happening, the so-called deep state was actually a state because it was officially instituted. The army has changed the constitution given self role. So when the army intervenes, it usually is working according to the constitution. If the chief of staff of the army runs a, a, the National Security Council and heads it, and the prime minister is a mere member in, the, in, that, uh, in that council, and this council issues a decision, then that's the state actually working. Uh, but uh, you could not say you could not say that about uh, you could not say that about uh, 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 about uh, what happened, for example, in Egypt later on some uh, some other countries. If uh, so, this is uh, the, the the first point is that the state is a public affair, and uh, the state uh, makes and enforces the law and uh, the body of rules behind it, and uh, it has to be acknowledged, have the right to use, uh, to impose and, and, and use even coercion. So there is maybe a, an, a, a kind of uh, uh, possibility that because the state, uh, especially the democratic state, uh, is an impersonal kind of, of, of unit in the sense that it is not uh, uh, the, 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 the most important development in the modern uh, in the modern uh, uh, state was that the state no longer identified with the persons who uh, who run it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the uh, uh, the state, especially, for example, in the United States, have got many federal and uh, non-federal, uh, 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 local, and uh, and so on, and, and it works at certain levels. So you cannot usually locate the state, where the state is difficult to locate. It, it might be everywhere, a lot of people are speaking the state, and everybody speaks about the state, but if you ask where is the state, it's not like Louis uh, XIV said, I am the state. So that's that's clear uh, kind of point. Here you have uh, this intangibility of the state. You cannot locate it. But uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there have been uh, uh, some arguments, especially Marxist arguments, about the state actually being in truth, something other than what it says on the team. The state claims to be 
as we said, impersonal, impartial, uh, law-abiding, but in the fact the Marxists would say it serves, it is actually a secretly the committee or the the, uh, the committee of the bourgeoisie. It's, uh, it's serving capital. And so uh, there is a deep state in this sense. This is, a, the, I think, the Marxism is the uh, mother of all conspiracy theories in the sense that it argues that there is a kind of always some person working behind the scene. Uh, the more uh, sophisticated later uh, Marxist uh, arguments were a little bit uh, less, uh, more speaking about elite control, speaking about uh, uh, all sorts of uh, in, uh, background articulation and so on and so on. But the idea is there. Now, we have in the, uh, in most countries nowadays usually two a populist movement, one left populist and one right populist. The right populist would say, well, like you, Anon, this state is being run by satanic uh, groups or, or pedophiles or at least uh, billionaires and so on and so on and so on. So it doesn't represent us, it represents this, this uh, interest. And the uh, left populist would say no, it's controlled by the capital and the international, the, uh, the multinationals and uh, uh, and so on and so on. But uh, I think when, when you look at this, then they probably cancel each other because it cannot be run by both, either this or that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, the <coughs> The Trump era, of course, brought in uh, a lot of arguments uh, in the <coughs> in the uh, 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 of the deep state. He kept using the deep state uh, term, and he was here, for example, uh, uh, in a press conference when uh, Pompeo was saying he's going to work, and he said, I will go to the deep state, because he thinks the State Department is probably the headquarters of the deep state. Anyway, uh, but uh, uh, my argument, my second argument is that because of what we said earlier about the publicity, uh, what Trump calls the deep state is actually the state, because the modern state, especially the modern democratic state, <clears throat> is built uh, around the core. This core uh, uh, is a permanent bureaucracy, the judiciary, the intellectuals, um, departments like the, the State Department, uh, the legal and, and, uh, and security apparatus, and so on and so on. Now, uh, this this core is actually supposed to maintain the core values and the law of the state. So even, for example, in the case of United States or in Britain or anywhere else, even if the parliament makes a decision and has a majority of the population, then the courts can say, no, you have, uh, you have, you have, uh, um, uh, you have uh, transcended the law, you've broken the law, or you have uh, broken some uh, important issues of human human rights. And, uh, and, and the principle, I can use actually principles. Uh, like for example, in uh, Trump, for example, tries to uh, put kids into, uh, into detention, immigrants, and the courts will say, no, you cannot do that. Uh, even though you have power. Now, these are, I think this is, this is what the state is about. The modern state is about. It's, this is not the deep state. This is that state. There are, of course, a lot of jokes about this in, uh, in comedies and others, especially in Britain when they, uh, uh, like this prime minister or some other uh, comedy shows, 
uh, in America to a certain level, the West Wing or whoever, uh, make fun of the fact that it's the bureaucrats or the, the, the subordinates who run the president or the, uh, or the prime minister, uh, which may well be uh, the case, but I think they are, it is, uh, it is understood in the uh, in the in the uh, in the ethics and uh, uh, the uh, the understanding of the of the of the public both the public and the politicians uh, that this is not this is not an aberration this is actually the right thing that if the president is corrupt or parliament is corrupt then the prosecutors will step in prosecute them the whistleblowers will come out uh, and, and, and make, uh, even there are laws now protecting whistleblowers. So uh, we cannot compare this, uh, for example, to what happened in Egypt, where uh, the, uh, uh, the coup against democracy and before the coup actually, uh, there was some sections of the uh, of the state, like the judiciary, for example, who decided to work against democracy, uh, and that was in about ten, because the judiciary in the during the Mubarak era was playing at least part of them, a section of them, was playing an important role in defending the state and defending the rule of law and challenging the uh, the government. Uh, uh, you know, on this, and they have been doing this for a while, but after uh, and before, just before the coup, they became, they, they allowed themselves to be part of the, uh, of the so-called conspiracy against the state. Actually, they fronted it, uh, starting from the acting president at that time, who uh, was uh, the president of the Constitutional Court who became part of the coup and the leader, and the many uh, now courts, which were trying people in the hundreds uh, and saying uh, very, uh, uh, let us say, an unbelievable and untenable uh, argument or cases, uh, and issuing execution uh, left and right, and I, I think I, uh, I would probably call this a treason of the judges, uh, like bandits, a treason of the intellectuals. Uh, but I think the judges in the case of Egypt uh, have, have more nefarious culpability here. So it would be problematic, I think, from my perspective, to uh, equate, uh, to, to to, to say, to describe what happened in Egypt as a deep or even shallow state, because what we are seeing now is uh, organized uh, criminal activity, uh, not in uh, Chile's metaphorical branding of early uh, states in Europe as organized crime in, in disguise, because it's one thing uh, to, uh, to be doing state business and profiting from it on the side. It's another thing to be doing crime and then using, uh, making a state business secondary to your crime. And actually even there, your state business also criminal, uh, doing the bidding of the anti-state uh, forces. Uh, now, <coughs> so, uh, the state in this in this regard, and this uh, will bring me uh, very near to my concluding uh, remarks, uh, is uh, according to uh, to the definition of state is something usually, as I said, the pub public power. Now, uh, 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 Max Weber, in his uh, famous uh, definition of the state in political education. Uh, called it the usual thing, human community that successfully claims to be, uh, to claim the monopoly of legitimate uh, use of physical force within a given territory. Now, I, 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 uh, I brought this definition 
not to adopt it as most people do. It's very interesting. I, uh, I, uh, I, when I was working on this, I, I, I read an interesting article which says that Max Weber, in fact, uh, the most cited person in social sciences. Uh, he is cited according the, the article was published in 2011, and it says that he was cited two million times, while Karl Marx was cited only one million. And the other uh, great sociologists like Durkheim, they are all in the hundreds of hundred thousand, hundred and thirty thousand. So he's he's a giant, he's tower, towering over everybody else. Uh, but my intention here is to, uh, to try to thoroughly this to deconstruct his uh, definition because I uh, I think right or wrongly this definition has put the focus about stateness into violence and force. While uh, the, uh, the real function of the state, so people were speaking about uh, force, it's monopoly, it's legitimacy, and so on. And, and they are always uh, going uh, around this, especially the territory. And, uh, but I think the real function of the state, even in uh, narratives of people like Hobbes is not to uh, monopolize or engage in violence, but actually to banish violence from society. Uh, Leviathan for Hobbes is a kind of authority which would then uh, uh, try to uh, keep the peace in the in the, in the, on the territory. And usually, both democratic and despotic governments, they sell themselves as a provider of peace and security for the inhabitants. Uh, to this point, of course, uh, what well, the state uh, created this insecurity in the first place, as organized crime would do, and then presented itself as the entity which of it. Uh, I, I, I take this, uh, I, I also think that this is uh, not completely correct because uh, uh, what uh, when um, violence may be needed at the beginning of establishing states, uh, but it is not the habit of the state to be using violence. Uh, there were exceptions for uh, marauding military guns like the Mongols and the Vikings, who were, uh, have been famous for engaging in limitless violence. But even these groups at one point settled. In the Mongols, they made empires and uh, made civilizations, similar to the, the, the Vikings also. Uh, so the state is a place where there should be a kind of uh, a secure territory. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the successful ruler uh, is somebody who would uh, try to minimize violence using uh, negotiations, cooperation, alliances, reputation, religion, social norms to enhance the legitimacy of freedom. Uh, I also, uh, uh, the, the state is a tool for redistribution and relocation of power. Uh, usually also successful uh, state is not uh, a lot of uh, argument you have heard and you will hear uh, argue that the most successful state is the one which monopolizes violence, monopolizing economic resources, and monopolize, monopolize uh, ideology or uh, legitimation uh, cultural uh, assets. Uh, when we observe 
uh, in reality, find that the most successful countries, the most peaceful and prosperous we've done in Scandinavia and other places, are countries which actually uh, minimize violence, don't concentrate wealth, don't deploy ideology. Uh, they are ones which uh, are open and, uh, and collaborative and they have uh, very, uh, very healthy uh, social security systems. Uh, so the, uh, I don't think the uh, successful, stable state, uh, the success of, uh, of states could be measured uh, in terms of this monopoly, uh, or, or team of, of foregrounding force. Uh, I mean, uh, most countries, I mean, when you speak about monopoly of violence, of course, it's usually a monopoly of overwhelming violence, because no country, no state can, can monopolize all violence. And some countries, for example, like the United States, deliberately choose not to and you have a second amendment which says anybody can have an arsenal in his home. Uh, you deliberately choose not to monopolize violence. Uh, but you, the state monopolizes overwhelming violence. So uh, if, if you see a kind of uh, uh, insurrections or somebody, you, can, uh, you have the, enough power to, to put it down. Uh, but uh, the success, I think, of the, of the state uh, should be measured in some form or another LSC civilizing process in the sense of using multiple uh, cultural, political, uh, social incentives and processes to make people move away from militarism uh, accept the banishing of, of violence within the political system uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, try to have avenues for channeling uh, and resolving conflict through elections, through dialogues, through coalitions, through all sorts of things. So the successful, I think, state uh, is the one, not the one which monopolizes violence, but the one which banishes the need for, for violence. Uh, Dr. Wahab, mm. sorry, you have five minutes left. Uh, I don't think I will need it <laughs> because I have ended. Uh, so uh, I think not monopoly of violence, but banishing violence from the uh, public sphere the measure of stateness in this in my in my narrative here uh, I, 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 I maybe it's a bit rush to try to venture a rival definition to beverage at this point uh, but I would maybe if I would if I were to I would uh, I would use also a short definition of the state as a territorially delimited political association under a dominant public authority which succeeds in containing uh, uh, violent challenges to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Wahab. I think the last part, uh, especially of your talk, captures a lot of the themes discussed by uh, many of our panelists, and I'm looking forward to a very uh, lively discussion around those issues. I'm waiting for uh, hands to be raised on my screen to see whom among the participants has questions. So I'll be monitoring my screen here. Okay, first is Dr. Sultan, please go ahead and unmute yourself first. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdel Wahab, uh, for this very interesting uh, exploration of the concept of the state. I just want to briefly uh, ask 
into your mind the difference between fragile and your old concept or your uh, original concept of um, a black hole because uh, I noticed a very interesting slight uh, variation of, of what we would you know take it on on face value black hole for us would mean a state where you don't quite know what goes on but the way you approach it you actually know what goes on what goes on is this amazing uh, inward sort of sucking force that uh, ends up eating the state or or uh, consuming itself and uh, do you see that uh, in any way similar to the uh, contemporary uh, discussions around state fragility and uh, in, and if so particularly in the arab world do you, do you have any examples where we've identified that L illness or uh, L in, in the organization and have attempted to address it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that's a very important uh, uh, point uh, because uh, we have, we're having uh, uh, important discussions over the, the past few years over uh, what I think uh, you call the fierce Arab state and I think uh, uh, Ayubi said, this is not a strong state. The fierce state is a fragile state, it's not weak, it's not, it's not strong. But it's seen that in, the, in most scholarly literature and in, uh, in some also Arab uh, popular arguments, uh, people would look at Saddam's Iraq or nowadays, uh, before that, uh, half the asset Syria and uh, Mubarak's Egypt, and say, well, these are really strong states uh, uh, in the sense that they seem to have big armies. Uh, they uh, they seem to have, uh, in the case of Iraq, lots of money. And in the case of Syria, they are uh, very good at, uh, at blackmail to get money from everybody. Uh, uh, so they also have money and they have weapons and they have they play uh, good politics. Uh, and then our uh, our argument on the black hole state idea is that uh, the very idea of contracting sometimes comes from a sense of power. Uh, when Saddam Hussein, for example, or Hafiz al Assad or Mubarak decide that. It is his family, the rule has to be uh, hereditary in his family, or Qaddafi as well. Uh, they feel a sense of invulnerability. I think that uh, there's, no, there's no longer anybody to carry them because they have already done away with, uh, with opposition. They have created such a state of terror that, as we said, nothing moves. There's no civil society, no freedom, no, no association, no political parties. Uh, and and they, they are feeling strong. And the, uh, the academics are calling them resilient states and, and resilient regimes and, and saying that they, they are here forever. And at that time, we're saying, no, they, they don't look that resilient. And uh, I remember uh, I used uh, another metaphor, I think that sometimes the black holes, when they contract too much, then they explode again. Uh, and and this, this is we, we, the way we saw it, is that these states were isolating actually themselves. And I think that's, that's how they broke down. Uh, they used to have a party. They used to have some coalition, they used to have supporters. For example, Bin Ali in Tunisia uh, had uh, around him the left and around him the liberals and all the anti-Islamists. Then slowly, slowly, he began even cracking down on those. Slowly, slowly, he started cracking down on his allies, even his close ministers, even everything. And then at the, in the end, when the revolution came, there was nobody there to, to stand by him. Uh, similarly, in, uh, I remember we used to have an argument with some of our young friends in, uh, in London when Saddam occupied Iraq, uh, occupied Kuwait, and there was jubilation among the young people there, especially, uh, and they were saying that, uh, well, look at Saddam, he 
he defied America. He did this and he's going to save Palestine. And I remember saying to my friend of mine, I fear that we're going to have another Palestine in Iraq. <laughs> this, ha- this is how I, I see it. Uh, and lo and, 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 and behold, that's what happened. We have now something as bad as Palestine, if not worse, in Iraq. Uh, so the, yes, you are right in the sense that uh, uh, there is what I call here unnecessary fragility. Because these are countries that had resources, that had uh, uh, all sorts of uh, mobilization techniques. If they wanted and they had allowed a little bit of leeway uh, and not contracted in the way they did, they could have been pro- probably a successful state. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Wahab. Thank you, Dr. Sultan, for the question. I'm looking for more for more hands here. If there are more, if there are no hands, I'm oh, happy. To you're happy to have another hand raised. Okay, you can raise it. I, I find it fascinating. Uh, but Dr. Abdul Wahab, do you distinguish in your research between institutions and state, and do you see the state as made up of a combination of institutions? And if, if yes or no, I don't know what, what you, what, the way you look at it. But uh, in terms of uh, the deep state, mm. I mean, we have a phenomena maybe in the Arab world uh, uh, of um, the deep state having penetrated institutions that overlived the state throughout the transition. I'll give you, for example, Egypt and the Ministry of, for Irrigation. People often refer to that as a state within a state. You know, it is. It's standing on its own. It could be Egypt, could be, you know, I know anyone could, could rule Egypt. No one can really touch that. And it goes so deep into history and numbers of employees and its own bureaucracy and so on. Uh, do you look into, into these issues of institutions or, or is it just focused on the political aspect of the state? Uh, no, no, I think uh, institutions, you cannot touch uh, the state without looking at institutions, but the state is always made up of institutions. And uh, uh, our problem was uh, uh, in the Arab report and other writings is that the vacuity of institutions. For example, in in the report, we we, we looked the way the state has operated uh, in that it becomes, as we said, the executive. For example, political parties is usually a a one-party system. But this party is not actually a party. Because as you know, for example, when the state went, this party disappeared. It is a kind of bureaucratic uh, addendum of the, of the, of the parliament, it's the same thing. But now in Egypt, uh, there is no parliament. There's a, a group of people who really go and are elected, but they never uh, oppose, they never have uh, ideas of their own, they don't have uh, power of any sort. And they are just so, uh, so even the, uh, usually uh, our, uh, uh, the thing we notice is that the only real institute in these countries were the Mukhabarat. The Mukhabarat is the only institute which functions and is not restricted in any way. It's given all the resources it, uh, it needs. It's not, it's the, only, it's the only one which can think also. <laughs> I mean, they, uh, they, the Mukhabarat people can write frank reports to their leader without fear. For example, if they know some opposition groups are, are strong, they would say, well, that group seems to be growing and we have to be careful. Uh, they are making successes. But the other institutions like parliament, they always uh, either dismiss, for example, the opposition, or uh, and so on and so on. So the, uh, uh, but I think the the the, the, the example of of the uh, the minister of irrigation, <clears throat> uh, I think probably it is like the Mukhabarat. It's already given some because it's it's very vital for the country. So the wise uh, the wise uh, regimes would not interfere with it because they might have problems if they do not. So they get the good technocrats in it and give them leeway. Uh, but in all other institutions, 
the black Wall Street business was to, to actually sabotage institutions. They sabotage the parliament, even the health service sometimes they sabotage. Uh, so uh, institutionalism in order to exist needs a kind of space uh, for people to, uh, for the technocrats, for the, for the actors, for the activists uh, to have a, a way to communicate, a way to, uh, to have initiatives and so on. But if you are saying, uh, even, for example, look at the media in Egypt today, they get their instruction about what to say from the Muhabarat every day. And that's why, for example, uh, uh, the Joshua loses most of his time by, uh, by playing on this. The same uh, 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 narrative is being told by every single uh, talk show host. The same thing, the, the same words. Because somebody, and there was a, the, a famous joke, uh, which was a reality when, uh, when that uh, broadcaster was reading a text message and, and then when she said, sent from my Samsung, Samsung, Samsung. <laughs> she, because she was reading, she was just reading what was sent to her. I see, she didn't think. Uh, so you cannot have effective media if you are the one who is telling them what to say. You are not allowing their talents or their own interaction with the public uh, and so on and so on. So I think that's, that's a big problem. Okay. Okay, Dr. Sultan. You have two hands only, so you're done. Uh, I'll uh, move to Rohini. And uh, Rohini, I remember Dr. Abdullah giving you a really hard time when you gave your talk. <laughs> so go ahead now. It's your turn. I, I apologize. I apologize. So that you, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't give me a hard time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. No, no, I don't intend to give you a hard time at all. Uh, am I audible? Uh, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Can hear you. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for your really rich lecture. Um, because you spoke of, you know, relocating power, fragility of the state, and the various institutions that are constantly in this, you know, dialectic relationship with each other. I thought I would take this opportunity to push the discussion further and, um, and ask ourselves if we are still looking at state in a very static form, especially in light of some of the critiques that Marxism and feminism provide on account of social arrangements of pattern and cumulative disparity, which can internally, you know, make a rational sense, but they can be both systemic, they can be both unjust, and sometimes these realities are not necessarily produced in theoretical forms yet, or the demand is yet to be created. So with those thoughts in mind, I was wondering if we're still fixating on a form of state that doesn't cater to some of these um, non-forms, some of these movements, some of the sense of, uh, you know, some of, some of where the movements come from and powerlessness. And I was curious to hear your thoughts on it. Okay, yes, I, uh, I think you, you are right in, the, in, in saying that uh, there are some uh, now new movements, some new ideas, uh, but I also take that with caution. I think the, uh, the populist movement, especially the, uh, the left populist and the young populist, uh, they see the, the right wing populist, they seem to be pushing uh, both of them, although they're criticizing the state, and also feminist, by the way, because uh, usually when somebody say, uh, the private is political or the personal is political. It means that you are inviting uh, action into the into the personal by the state who will act at the state. The uh, 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 the right wing when they say there's a conspiracy, there's somebody who is uh, behind the scenes who is uh, stealing our state or stealing our elections. Uh, then they are inviting the state to come in, and they are inviting it to come in in, in a non-democratic way, in, in the sense of imposing uh, things on people. 
uh, and uh, uh, we saw uh, what happened in the in the uh, in the capital capital hill uh, last week when people feeling that they are being uh, robbed they they wanted uh, not only the state but a violent kind of state uh, to take over the country maybe the military or something like that uh, so I, I would uh, I would take that with my point about also civil society and being careful about civil society because in countries like India, for example, or Sudan, or other countries, uh, when you have civil society or uncivil society, let's put it this way, of Hindutva for group and and and, 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 and gangs and, uh, and and violence, uh, uh, and maybe also in the media uh, groups which are inciting violence and stories about uh, other people. Uh, we have to, uh, it's food for thought anyway, I think we have to rethink a lot of things. All right. Uh, any more questions, Rohini? All right. So uh, Dr. Musa raised his virtual hand and I think Dr. Muhammad al-Masri raised his real hand unless he was uh, scratching his head. I couldn't tell. So I'll start with Dr. Musa. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdul Wahab and also uh, Dr. Amal. Um, actually, it's a very interesting lecture today we heard. Um, my question is linked to the question of uh, Dr. Uh, Sultan. It's about the formal uh, state and, and institution. Also, my question it is uh, what is the role of the informal state uh, and institutions? They are very important. They come from of the, the role of the games in most of the um, of the state organizations. So um, it is also about the state society relations. And you know that I think most of the Arab states, they, the leaders, they focus more to have well organized and informal uh, state and institution. And also they, they have very weak state institutions. And this is, it was one of their dirty games to also survive in ruling their countries for a long time. And this is also in Yemen, in Libya, and many, many states. And I think um, if we're trying to, to fill the whole black, uh, 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 the, the black hole in these states, we must to have approaches to how to reform these informal state and institution. Because we have so many, so many programs by donors, by the state themselves, they're trying to reform the formal state and institution. And what what uh, we 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 feel for all uh, uh, programs and policies we we implemented in so many countries uh, because we just simply uh, approach the formal state and institutions and we don't have any agenda to how to approach or understand the informal state uh, and institutions. Uh, thank you so much. Can you explain what you mean by formal state and institutions? Is this institutions that are part of state or. Um, or, or civil society or societal uh, organization. Yeah, it can be it can be different uh, different informal state and institutions like tribes, like um, informal organizations that established by the state itself. Um, it can be also uh, some biased civil society organization. It can be different different forms of organization. And I think James Scott uh, he has written uh, a, a nice book about the informal state and institution and organization. And he told that these informal institution, they have the role of the games. It can be also the tradition in the society. It can be the social norms. It, it can be different, different uh, aspects. Because, you know, when you go to an institution, you have formal rules, you have formal also regulations there. But if you see the function of these state organization, it pays on informal rules. It's always these informalities or the informal institutions, they are more, they are uh, uh, forming the role of the game inside the uh, formal institutions and organization of any state in Arab countries. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, probably I uh, understood what you, you mean by this. The uh, uh, there are uh, problems with this, I think, uh, kind of institution. Um, uh, I have been looking at 
and the issue of tribalism and uh, sectarianism and also uh, the issues of clientelism of the state creating uh, like societies or organization in order as a, as a way of funding loyal yeah. alliances. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, I am, I am in, uh, I, I, I'm in many minds about this because uh, there's a question of whether such institutions are actually forms of corruption and cooptation, and they also perpetuate uh, tribalism and uh, sectarianism and, and create issues. Uh, on the other hand, I know uh, from experience that attempts to fight tribalism uh, had led to even more serious issues of uh, dictatorship, and then you go again to uh, mobilize tribalism. For example, in Iraq, uh, which is a case where it was a, a very fierce state, and of course, it, uh, uh, it, it did do away with tribalism in the official or formal or informal. But then when this state was threatened, and when, uh, of course, uh, and that's, that's a feature, a feature of the black hole state in the sense that uh, they build up the party, but then they feel that the party is a threat. So they do away with the party and go back to their clans or go back to their, uh, to their kin and their children and their uh, cousins, and they put them in power because they don't trust anybody else. Uh, at the same time, when the opposition to the, to the regimes uh, strengthens, uh, it creates, again, tribal and sectarian. And um, I mean, we have seen that in Sudan, where uh, the, the attempts of the state to repress, uh, for example, sectarianism. We have a, a mild set of sectarianism in Sudan, where uh, we have the Khatmiya, for example, and the Ansar al the Mahdist. And these sectarian um, uh, outfits are very loose coalitions involving many tribes and many uh, many ethnicities and so on and so on. So you find the Khatni, for example, have people from Darfur, have people from the east, people from the north. So there is here the umbrella which unites some parts of the country. Now the government, the regime, tried to break it up because these are the rivals, these are political rivals. When they succeeded partly in this, uh, we had even more fierce tribal and ethnic conflicts. Some groups which otherwise would have been part of this coalition. And this coalition, usually these parties uh, in democracies get to power. So these people felt part of the power apparatus. And if you have a coup, eliminate the, 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 the government uh, post for this, which they used to use for clientelism and so on and so on, then you create what we saw in Darfur, what we saw in the East, what we saw everywhere in creating ethnic wars. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I would, I would withhold judgment. I think uh, using clientelism is problematic. I'm trying to fight tribalism and sectarianism is also problematic in countries like ours. Okay. Uh... Dr. Mohammed the Masri, it's your turn. Uh, uh, sorry, I I, uh, I couldn't, you know, find uh, the feature where I could raise my hand, so I had to raise it, you know, <laughs> like I'm, I'm scratching my. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, talk or lecture. Uh, however, you left us with uh, uh, many questions, or at least. It seems that the Arab state is a unique state. Uh, it's different to the other states, and it might be, you know, uh, that is uh, different. Uh, so I'm not going, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask a question, but I, I want to give a few comments, maybe, 
uh, that would contribute to the uniqueness of the Arab state. But in the beginning, I want to object to the idea that you mentioned that uh, that the Mukhabarat or the intelligence services is, is autonomous or relatively independent, and they are thinking. If they are the ones who are giving the Egyptian media what to say, I think that they don't think, you know. I mean, I think at least, you know, the level of their thinking is, <laughs> is, is below the average of uh, <laughs> the IQ. Uh, uh, why I'm saying that, you know, uh, 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 that they don't have, um, uh, or maybe they don't have this uh, autonomy because we haven't seen in any of the Arab countries that the intelligence services is conspiring or plotting against the regime and they managed to change the regime. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, we saw, you know, many times, you know, different uh, 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 the army is is plotting against the regime, orchestrating coup, the uh, uh, coups against the regime, and the intelligence services is interfering to protect the regime. Uh, three things that I want to mention, maybe you know, maybe you are aware of it, but I mean, this space between the regime and the state in the Arab world uh, doesn't exist. Even, you know, in the perception of the people, of the Arab people, they feel that the political regime and the state is one entity. And whenever they are criticizing uh, the political regime, that they feel that they are criticizing the state. And this is a source is even used by the regimes in order to say that these uh, people are national, uh, they are not nationalist enough or they don't care about uh, their own country. Uh, that's uh, the first thing. The second thing, you know, the establishment of the Arab state, especially in al mashriq it's always having this contradictory location. Even the political elite that created the, the state. In one hand, they feel that they are a state in a transition waiting for the Arab unity and being of a bigger Arab state. And on the other hand, they are doing the opposite, consolidating the power and the institutions of the Arab state. This is the political elite that was, uh, uh, was creating the state. If we go if we go even to the political opposition in these countries, they are doing the same. They are rejecting the entire state because the project or maintaining the national state in the Arab Mashriq is uh, in a way or another betraying the Arab dream of having one state and, uh, uh, and fulfilling the colonial power well in dividing the Arab countries. Thank you very much. I shouldn't have let him ask any question. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, very I mean, Dr. Abdul Wahab could comment about, yeah. about, uh, about uh, these things. Uh, I mean, I, 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 oh, the, the, the think, our thinking friends. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, the points you, you have made are also uh, worth some the exploration. I think uh, uh, it is very interesting uh, in this, uh, uh, as you rightly said, that there is a rhetoric, for example, of national unity and or Arab unity, and and uh, most of the of the wars are against the Arab neighbors. <laughs> yeah, the even, for example, in the countries which are very far away, for example, Algeria and Morocco. And it is very silly that you have the borders closed and then you are trying to find, for example, agreement with the European Union about free trade. And, uh, and then families here who have been uh, living with each other for centuries cannot go across uh, the border to, to greet their own families. And then you, 
uh, why do you take your goods to Europe to sell? Why you can sell it, for example, in the next door? And so the, the Maghrib al Arabi uh, kind of uh, union uh, was destroyed by people who say, well, we want Arab unity and Muslim unity and all sorts of this, but they can't stand their neighbors. <laughs> they, they, can't, they don't want to help them and they don't even sometimes want their help. Uh, the, uh, you speak about modernizing and secular and, and so, and then you go to your tribe and to your sect and uh, kiss the hands of the mullahs and, uh, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and there is, a, there is a kind, I think, of, uh, uh, of we call schizophrenia <laughs> in this, in this as part of the problem, I think. And uh, my own analysis for this which I, uh, uh, I think I, uh, I made it uh, with my colleagues clear in, in, in genocide and nightmares, is that these governments or these regimes or these parties, they use narratives, what I call narrative of insecurity, uh, to, uh, well, I think uh, uh, Saad al uh, was his name, uh, uh, the Egyptian uh, sociologist, uh, he, uh, he once uh, spoke of legitimacy, legitimacy of blackmail, uh, where the regime would say, uh, well, somebody is going to come to you with worse than us. So you better, <laughs> you better tolerate us because what's coming could be worse. And they also, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they try to uh, uh, make people afraid, uh, seeing that, for example, all the Muslim, now, for example, the rhetoric of, uh, of the Egyptian regime, everything, all the Ikhwan are doing this, all the Ikhwan are coming, all the Ikhwan. Uh, in fact, this creates the opposite, uh, the opposite to uh, what is required. Because if you are speaking about Ikhwan every day, you might be promoting them. <laughs> I once said that maybe a CC is secretly a member of Ikhwan. As <laughs> he's asking everybody who's needed to talk about Ikhwan 24 hours. And in this regard, people who are upset with the regime might say, well, it's a good idea if Ikhwan come, or, or maybe let's look where Ikhwan are so that we can join them because if they are so powerful and they are doing all these things. Uh, so you, uh, in the past, some of them used to say Israel is a threat and we, are, uh, we have to uh, have unity. Now they have many other threats, especially uh, to their uh, to the sectarian power. In Iraq, I, I imagine that the Shia leaders like these uh, guys who are uh, pro-Iranian would be telling everybody, look, we have to stick together. Otherwise, for example, the Sunnis will come back and Saddam will come back and, and, and Daesh will come back. And uh, I imagine also the Sunnis are saying the same, that if we don't do something really uh, drastic, uh, the Shia is going to rule us forever and we have to do something. So we have, we have problems. Uh, we don't have the kind of leadership uh, which would come out and say to people, although I, I can I, I can see the current, uh, for example, prime minister in Iraq, I think he is, he looks to be working sincerely towards a, a kind of national reconciliation uh, to grant to strengthen the state. And here, I think this is very important. Uh, in the case of Iraq, when you speak about the strengthening the state, <laughs> you are talking about the sectarian militias and other who are, who are actually preventing the state from uh, being a real state, from, uh, uh, from limiting violence. Uh, and they are the ones, for example, who are killing the demonstrations, especially the intellectuals among them and the, uh, the, the ladies and so on. So it is, it is a problem. Uh, and uh, of course, I don't agree with you that our brothers in the Mukhabarat are not intelligent, they are very intelligent, because they might be listening to me now. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> I remember I was once in London going to the, uh, riding a taxi to one of the TV stations. And the taxi asked me, why are you going? And I said, I'm going there. And at that time, it was a war in Iraq. And he said to me, uh, the, these intelligence agencies, uh, it means in Britain, they should be so sued under the Trade Description Act. <laughs> because they claim to be intelligent. <laughs> And they have nothing to do with it. They call themselves intelligence agencies. And so, uh, so I, I like that joke very much. Uh, Dr. Abdulhab, our time is up, but I have a question in the Q&A section here. And I think you've answered maybe aspects of it throughout. But let me, um, let me read it. Uh, and it's from Ahmed Dawad. Can you distinguish between state on one hand and government regime administration? What's the boundary between the two? For it seems from the discussion that the two concepts are sometimes collapsing into each other. Uh, can, can, um, can be brief, Dr. What, what, Abdullah. What is the, uh, hmm? what's the, can you read the, what a regime and what? Uh, <clears throat> can you distinguish between state on one hand and government uh, slash regime slash administration on the other hand? Mm -hmm. We have two uh, minutes. Uh, thank you, Taban Ahmed. Ahmed Awad uh, is uh, a dear friend of mine. He is uh, now, unfortunately, the former uh, foreign minister of Somalia was until a couple of months ago the minister. Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, this is an important question, and uh, uh, it is often uh, I think confused in some of the literature, but um, there is a correlation. Uh, and some people argue uh, when they say, for example, Iraq is a strong state or Egypt in a strong state, uh, they are looking at uh, the way regimes are, uh, uh, are look strong. Uh, but I think they, there is, of course, a, a, diff a, a big difference uh, uh, in, in the sense that especially in democracies, there is. But sometimes uh, for, uh, for uh, totalitarian or dictatorial regimes, they deliberately, and this may be an answer to an earlier question, we've mentioned this, uh, that uh, people said that, I think the, the question or the commentator said that uh, people see if they are angry with the, or, or they are hostile to the regime, they are hostile to the state. And this is what actually the regimes actually want you to believe. The, especially in Egypt, for example. In Egypt, uh, they will see a dollar. And we hifaz al dollar. And for them, a dollar means a regime. Uh, but they seem to be destroying the state uh, uh, and not actually the, the regime, strengthening the regime at the moment is destroying the state and weakening it. Because if you have a situation where you are excluding the majority of people, uh, then that's that's uh, that's an issue. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Wahab, for the talk and for a lively Q and A session. Um, uh, we'll have to end it now because uh, we're reconvening at six p.m. Uh, thanks for our audience. Thanks for all your questions, and we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you very much.